तुम्हारा बहु आभार आज तमने मने अहिया आमंत्रित करो छे मने माफ कर जो अबे हूँ अंग्रेजी मा बात करूँ छू ऑनरेबल चेयरमैन प्रोफेसर पटेल माय डियर एंड डिस्टिंग्विश्ड फ्रेंड्स गुड मॉर्निंग इट इज वेरी थॉटफुल ऑफ युगांतर टू ऑर्गेनाइज ए नेशनल यूथ कॉन्फ्रेंस टू कमेमोरेट द हंड्रेड फिफ्टीएथ बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ महाराजा सयाजी राव His name shall always shine and stand high in the annals of the growth of educational and democratic institutions in India. MS University, Baroda, is one of the most prestigious universities of our country. Also. I am very much touched by the objectives and the agenda of Yugantar. My compliments and best wishes for the success of the Yugantar movement. I would call it a movement. Friends, this session is devoted to the theme reforming India's democracy after listening to the five presentations that have been made before us i think it is hardly necessary for me to say anything i believe all the relevant points have been covered and i have listened to these presentations as a student and feel educated i have sometimes i sometimes feel that my generation is really the guilty generation of this country those of you who are familiar with the upanishads and know about the kathopanishad i would like to tell them that my generation is the generation of nachiketa's father the youth today are the nachiketas and i would like to be i would like to see them as nachiketas talking of democracy i am reminded of sir winston churchill a person whom most of us do not like he once said democracy is the worst form of government except that human ingenuity has not been able to devise a better one friends we can take legitimate pride in the fact that despite many internal and external threats natural and man made disasters freedom rule of law and democracy have survived in india India is one of the few countries of the world with a functioning democracy. We are also the only country in the world with some 3.6 million elected rulers. More than 10 lakhs of them women from panchayats to parliament. Indian democracy has to its credit many achievements during the last 62 years i need hardly flag the point that in matters of providing good governance and sustainable development with a human face gujarat has shown the way there is however another another side of the all india picture there is a wide gulf between the conceptual and the factual 
between the rhetoric and the real. Currently, our nation is passing through critical times. Democracy is under severe strain. Faith of the people in the quality, integrity, and efficiency of governmental institutions stands seriously eroded. There has been a steep fall in the standards of conduct in public life and administration. There is a crisis of character and values in politics and public administration. Growth of a certain cynicism towards normal democratic processes and an erosion in the respect for political parties, politicians, legislators, and civil servants present a disturbing scenario. The source of many of our maladies is in the disregard of the interests of the citizen and the absence of good governance, both at the union and the state level. In fact, I sometimes feel we have not yet become citizens. We still remain subjects. And the citizen is treated, ordinary citizen, is treated by even the smallest government functionary, whether he be a constable or a clerk on the other side of the counter. Citizens are treated like dirt. We have been privy to a long succession of his camps in recent past. These were enough to put Indian democracy to shame. Never before in living memory, in such a short span of time, so many scams of such mind-boggling magnitude had hit the headlines. What was even more disturbing was the fact that all these scams revealed only the tip of the iceberg. Much more was hidden below the surface. Perhaps the Dequiets quarrel only when, and it is only then we come to know of his scams. Not only did the scams involve alleged swindling of billions of public money by persons in high places, but these also had the effect of eroding the credibility of all the known institutional pillars of democracy, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. One cannot underestimate the negative impact, the negative impact potential of the scams which overshadowed all the great achievements as also the new challenges confronting Indian democracy. No wonder Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh himself was constrained to express sadness and say that he was worried about the future of parliamentary democracy in India. More than half a century earlier, the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, had asked whether with the demands of the people and the problems of government having multiplied many fold, the political structure and procedures of parliamentary democracy had become out of date and may have to go, Nehru's words, whether procedures of parliamentary democracy had become out of date and may have to go, and how far can parliamentary democracy be adapted to meet the new burdens and functions of government satisfactorily, effectively, and in time." Unquote. Answering the question himself, Jawaharlal Nehru had concluded that our parliamentary system of government with all its failings was better than all the others, which lead to some measure of authoritarianism. But as Nehru said, Further, it does not mean that we should close our eyes to the grave problems 
we often have to face in the country and the disruptive tendencies that raise their ugly heads and challenge the democratic process." Unquote. In any case, friends, it would be wrong to reduce the theme of reforming democracy to a debate on presidential versus parliamentary forms of government. The celebrated poet Pope is often quoted to say about forms of government let fools contest whatever is best administered is the best. Also, there is nothing like the president, nothing like the presidential system or the parliamentary system. There are many variants of both. There is the US system and the UK system. It is a myth that we adopted the British parliamentary system. What we have is actually the continuation and adaptation of the colonial model as it was developed by the British in India. Our constitution makers also incorporated in the text of the constitution a number of features from the US system. We are a republic like United States. We have the president as the head of the executive. All executive powers and supreme command of the armed forces, according to the constitution, vest in the president. We have a federalist structure with the distribution of powers between the union and the states. With every citizen having multiple identities, however, Indian pluralism and diversity are unique and constitute a real strength for its unity. Diversity is our strength. There are no ethnic monoliths in India, unlike the United States. No ethnic monoliths. The same person who is in a majority according to one indicator is a, in a minority according to another indicator. The minorities and majorities cut across each other. So we, each one of us has multiple identities. According to one identity, I may be in a minority. According to another identity, I may be in a majority. And that is why it is a unique kind of uh, pluralism and constitutes strength for Indian unity. Your uh, concept note in regard to this conference refers to the series of economic reforms post-1991. With due respect, I beg to submit that under the camouflage of the slogans of one world and a global village, ordinary citizens, instead of being the masters in democratic polity, have been increasingly reduced to being mere consumers of goods and services. The result is tremendous erosion in the democratic rights and freedoms of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the organs of the state. We in India also have a concept of globalization, but our concept is that of Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam, Udara Charita Namtu, Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam. For the liberal minded, the whole world is a family. So our globalization is for treating the entire world as one family. In a family, you share the joys and sorrows of each other. In a family, you give and take. While the present day globalization is for making the whole world a mandi a marketplace where everything is sold and bought. So there is a fundamental difference between our concept of one world and the Western concept of one market or one global village. In the history of democracy world over, I would like to submit another point. There, were, there has never been a fully developed or perfect democracy. It is always developing. Every democracy is developing. Every challenge offers an opportunity to move farther, faster. On the road to democracy, there is no journey's end. However, it cannot be denied 
that never before has Indian democracy been confronted with more formidable challenges than during recent years. Nothing can conceal the truth that our democratic processes are still largely dependent on caste and communal vote banks and criminals and are run with colossal amounts of black money generated through crime and corruption and that the parties and leaders who present before the people opposite agenda and fight the polls against each other often commit a fraud on the people by coming together after the polls to share the fruits of power. I think uh, enough has been mentioned about uh, criminalization of politics. Sometimes I say that our melodies can be summed up in three, three C's, communalism, casteism, communalism, casteism, corruption, and criminalization, four C's. And three MPs, money power, muscle power, and mafia power. I think that sums up the state. The issues that worry us and call for reforms in working of our democracy are many. The case for reforming democracy is unassailable. Enough has been written and talked about criminalization of politics and politicization of crime, all pervasive corruption, role of money, muscle and mafia power, and caste and communal vote bank politics. Other areas that concern us and need reforms are, one, union state relations. Friends, remember, there is no concept of the center in the Constitution of India. The Constitution makers definitely, definitely rejected the concept of a center and states in the periphery. You pick up a copy of the Constitution and see the word center has not been used. It speaks of the union. But I, but, uh, I am sorry to say that our uh, politicians, our bureaucrats, and even our political science teachers speak of center state relations. The moment you say center, there is a, words are very important things. The moment you say center, the image is created of a center of authority and the rest being in the periphery. But the constitution makers did not want a center of power and states in the periphery. They wanted the relationship should to be between the whole and the parts. Union is the whole. Center is a point in the middle of the circle. Union is the whole. And the constitution speaks of the union and the states. So relationship is between the whole and its parts, not between the center and its periphery. So the first area which needs reforms, I think union is state relations. Demands for further reorganization of states. And although I hate the word decentralization, but then uh, for the sake of convenience, I would say decentralization of powers to grassroots. I hate the word decentralization because the central, I object to the word centralization itself. And decentralization, is it smacks off as if centralization was all right, power belongs to the center, and now we are condescending to transfer power to the people. What do you mean by transferring power to the people? The power belongs to the people. You are usurpers. You are usurpers. Power belongs to the people. It is for the people to give a bit of it to whatever agency they like. So these terms like decentralization of power, transfer of power to the people, I think these are uh, misleading. But then there is need for this de decentralization of powers to grassroots, where it really belongs. The misuse of Article 356, Dr. Ambedkar had said in the Constituent Assembly that it was as a matter of abundant caution that they were putting in Article 356, and he said he hoped that this article will never be used and will remain a dead letter as it has happened more than 120 times it has been used. So there is need to look at Article 356. Responsibilities for hindering problems 
of uh, jihadi terrorism, Naxalism, Maoism, etc., sometimes acting in concert with their internal and external ramifications, reforming and regulating by law the political parties and electoral system and processes. Systemic political reforms, including parliamentary and judicial reforms and review of public administration, all with a view to ensuring citizen-centric, citizen-friendly, clean and corruption-free, transparent and accountable government. Population control, which is hardly spoken of. No party wants to speak it from public platform. Then reservation policies, another matter on which no political party wants to speak in the open. The question of the rights of tribals, protection of environment, and illegal exploitation of mineral resources. These are some six areas which I think need uh, urgent reforms. I am not going into details. The conduct of our legislators, ministers, and bureaucrats, and the goings on in the houses of our legislatures are matters of disgrace for Indian democracy. The system under which we live has led to and nurtured an excess between the businessman, the politician, the civil servant, the police, the criminal, and I hate to say, sometimes even the media. Governments have lost their credibility, legitimacy, and in even their representative credentials. The degradation and erosion of democratic processes has reached such low levels that fighting elections has become impossible without several crores of rupees and private armies of gunda gangs. In big cities, slums are big business for the politicians and criminals. I am told in the last Lok Sabha elections, some persons bought their tickets. The first fight is to get the ticket. Bought their tickets for five crores. One person paid five crores to get the ticket and they spent another 10 crores for the election campaign. Now, if he becomes a member with, 50, with the expenditure of 15 crores, he is also concerned with the ROI, return on in investment. How do you expect him to be not corrupt and not to recover that 15 crores? And he has not only to recover that 15 crores that he spent, but he has to earn much more to share the booty with the bosses because the bosses want him to raise money and give it to them. And also he has to earn another 15 crores for the next election. So he has to earn hundreds of crores in order to uh, not be out of pocket after five years. Also, I was mentioning in the tea break, somebody told me, a very senior leader of the party told me, he said, do you know that our party has to spend several crores per day, several crores per day to keep going. And if you have to spend several crores per day for keeping the party going and for fighting elections, where is that money to come from? Nobody asks that question and nobody answers it from public platforms. But that is important. Things have come to such a pass that some concerned citizens and thinkers have begun to see question marks against the democratic model adopted by us and operated for more than 62 years. In the midst of dismal poverty, abysmal illiteracy, and alarming inequalities, a functioning parliamentary democracy, good governance, citizen-friendly administration, human development, and nation building are so much poppycock, make no sense. The spectac spectacle of unethically engineered or defection manipulated majorities or of several successive hung legislatures or coalition governments of disparate elements coming together solely for sharing the fruits of power and including some of the goon leaders with criminal records or otherwise doubtful antecedents are all matters of grave concern. 
the price of legislators on sale is said to be running into several crores a piece. It is no exaggeration, it is a reality. The governments continue in power by selling either ministerships or by buying the support of legislators by paying crores of rupees per member. It is happening, believe me. Democracy has often been described as the government of the people, for the people, by the people, as the friends also said. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, in his con concluding his speech in the Constituent Assembly on 25 November 1949, however, made the following pregnant remark, and I quote. Dr. Ambedkar said, times are changing. People, including our own, are being moved by new ideologies. They are getting tired of government by the people. They are getting tired of government by the people, Ambedkar said. They are prepared to have government for the people and are indifferent whether it is government of the people and by the people. They want government for the people and they are indifferent to whether it is government of the people and by the people." Unquote. The most tragic development for democracy has been the sharp decline in the strength and credibility of institutions, the democratic institutions in particular, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, and even the fourth estate, the media, have suffered an image deficit. The union government tries to dominate and dictate to states undermining democracy at the state level and as a result the union government does not enjoy the normal regard and esteem from state governments. The collective responsibility of the Council of Ministers at the union level has become a sham. What the Prime Minister calls the constraints of coalition politics or comparisons of coalition politics create a situation where to remain in power, the Prime Minister is <coughs> uh, the, where to remain in power, the Prime Minister and the larger coalition partner have to agree to be blackmailed by small parochial parties demanding their pound of flesh creamy portfolios and freedom to make money. It becomes part of the coalition agreement that they will not be disturbed when they are making money. Ministers speak in different voices. They contradict each other in an utter violation of the concept of collective responsibility. They disregard even the prime minister. The prime minister himself the Prime Minister himself is not an elected representative of the people. He never won an election. Only once he contested from New Delhi and lost. The Prime Minister is not an elected representative of the people. He never won an election. Only once he contested election to Lok Sabha from New Delhi and lost badly. In all parliamentary democracies, if we call up our democracy parliamentary democracy, the prime minister has to be an elected member of the lower house. Conceptually, that should be so in our country also, but for the last many years, as we know, it is not so. I, I have nothing against the person of the prime minister. What I'm saying is the principle, the principle of it, the institution has been denigrated. Institution's credibility has been eroded. Also, he is not the leader of the house because he is not elected. He is not even the leader of his party. He is a representative of the state of Assam where he has not lived for 10 days at any time. He's supposed to be a representative of the state of Assam in the Council of States and 
His credentials are that of a nominee of the leader of the Congress party. I mention these facts because I am saying that the credibility of institutions has been brought down. The Council of Ministers with the Prime Minister at its head is not in practice the supreme executive of the country, which it is supposed to be according to the Constitution. And I think a friend pointed it out. It is believed that the National Advisory Council is in the nature of a super cabinet. It is not, it is not in the Constitution. It's not a constitutional institution, entirely extra constitutional, extra, entirely extra legal, and, but it's supposed to be uh, the super cabinet. The institutions of the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers were never so devalued or so deinstitutionalized as they are today. People have seen the representative democratic governments becoming governments of the corrupt, by the corrupt, for the corrupt. The new definition of democracy. It is a highly competitive world and we have to strive towards excellence reform. Either we perform or we will perish. People need governments that can govern. They want good governance and not merely governments by the claimants of the spoils of power in the name of representation. The policy of reservations has ceased to be a policy for the upliftment of the deprived sections. It has instead become the vote bank politics of always keeping them backward and deprived. Dr. Ambedkar incidentally was strongly opposed to reservation for any class of people in perpetuity. He wanted it for a certain number of years, more than 10, but he said thereafter, parliament should have no power to extend it by law because I do not want this blot on Indian society to become permanent. But now there is no party which can speak about it. Even those who take the name of Dr. Ambedkar, they don't speak about his views, and those who are opposed to him also put his photographs, but do not abide by, by what he wanted. There is clamor for representation through reservation for newer and newer categories. In fact, there is a competition and a struggle for backwardness. All of us want to be more backward than the others and claim benefits on that ground. With the greatest respect to them, I would like to ask why are there no reservations for the below poverty liners? The below poverty liners, are they not backward? Should there not be reservation for all the below poverty liners, irrespective of their castes and communities? Democracy would have, friends, to rethink its fundamentals to suit the needs of the 21st century. Perhaps democracy as we, as we know it today is not enough. We have to revisit, reinvent, and revitalize it to save and serve the common man. With majority of the members of Lok Sabha and state assemblies elected with minority of votes cast, kindly note, 78% of all the members of Lok Sabha today had more votes cast against them than for them. 78% of them were elected by minority of votes cast, not minority of the electorate. Some of them were elected with 7% of the votes cast or 12% of the votes cast and they became ministers. Those who, who have majority of voters against them, can they be called representatives of the people? Can we call it a representative parliamentary democracy? So that is a systemic problem. No wonder there are 300 crore patis in present Lok Sabha and there are 153 to 175 members with criminal background. We cannot call them criminals because the courts have not yet decided. In some cases, the, in, in some uh, cases, uh, the matter has been pending for decades and no magistrate at the lower level has the power to uh, declare the murderer a convict. So he continues to be a man with a criminal background but is not a convicted criminal.
with the majority of members of the Lok Sabha and the state assemblies elected with minority of votes cast, we made a study and we found 70% of all members elected to state assemblies and uh, Lok Sabha were elected by minority of votes. When more votes are cast for others, how can they be called representatives of the people? Almost all parties and candidates are busy building their vote banks on the basis of caste, communal, linguistic, or, uh, or other such identities as, you see, we talk of recall and compulsory voting and uh, uh, negative voting and so on. But if the situation is, the statistics tell us that if you have a guaranteed vote bank of 15% in your constituency, you are 90% sure of winning the election. So if, if you are elected a member of parliament or a member of a state legislature with 15% supporters in your constituency, why should you bother about the other 85%? That is why you have caste vote banks, communal vote banks, and vote banks created by outright purchase of voters. In one state, a study showed that uh, 34% of actual voters were bought by cash. Cash was paid in at least 34% cases. So either you buy voters by cash or by bottles of whiskey or, by, uh, or, or on caste basis or communal basis, what you need is 15%. Because with the more than 1,300 parties, do you know how many parties we have in this country, all of whom can contest election? more than 1300 parties are registered with the election commission and they can all put up candidates whether they do or not is another matter but we have 1300 parties and sometimes the list of candidates is so long that uh, the uh, that it uh, it would be almost a book if you put all the, all the names down in that situation what happens is that a person getting 7% 12% votes wins so that calls for a systemic change. And this system provides all the advantage in the power game in playing divisive politics and building separate identities. In politics today, the advantage is if you are able to relate yourself to a minority. If you can build a 15% separate identity class and relate yourself to those 15%, you have all the advantages in politics. There is no, in ad no advantage in being an Indian. Today, the smallest minority in the country is the Indian. In the previous session, we had a very powerful speaker and uh, heads off to him. I heard him with great respect and uh, full agreement. But where is the Indian today? You have to take a lantern in hand in broad daylight to look for an Indian. You have either a person relating himself to his region or to his caste or to his community or to his language group, but hardly an Indian. Because being an Indian does not give you any political advantage. The picture is no better on the administration front. A large percentage of civil servants have become servile or developed a nexus with the politicians in corruption and defrauding the people. They have not learned the simple truth that, it, that in a democracy, the people are the masters and all the functionaries of the state are and must function as servants of the people. 